Right now, free speech is under heavy attack in New Zealand and overseas, with governments constantly devising new ways to enforce censorship. To make sure you never miss the critical news and breaking stories you rely on, join the RCR mailing list today. Get connected now at realitycheck.radio forward slash email. Professor Grant Schofield is a public health researcher with an interest in nutrition. He wrote the foreword of Dr. Kirsted's report. Let's see what he has to say about the challenges to academic freedom in New Zealand universities. Joining me now is Professor Grant Schofield. Uh, welcome to The Crunch. Thanks, Ken. Good to see you. Well, it's, it's good to be here. And I was reading the foreword that you wrote for the New Zealand Initiative report about unpopular opinions and academic freedom. And there's a couple of things in there that kind of rattled my cage a bit, and I thought, I need to talk to you. Now, why don't you tell us what you wrote in the in the forward, and then I've got a couple of questions for you that we can um, run through because some things interest in me about your your journey. Yeah, so the um, James Kirstead's work in the New Zealand Initiative in that report, you know, first of all, I just want to commend him. I think it's a really good synthesis. So um, I wrote a forward a while back when the Free Speech Union put out their survey results and looked at, at how people felt about free speech in New Zealand universities, um, and then included my university, which AUT, which actually did the worst. Uh, and then I you know, summarily received a, you know, a barrage of of mostly faceless but abusive emails from random academics around the country that I should just shut up and you know, all from the progressive left who didn't quite get what I was saying. And then they were you know, criticising the quality of the research. I suppose one good thing about this report from James is it goes to another level, right? Because it, it's not just that research that he quotes, but there's research from all around the world. There's more data out of New Zealand. And then there's you know, excruciating detail on the misjustices, I suppose, but, you know, particularly things like the Listener 5, um, the behaviour of the University of Auckland and these sorts of things. So, yeah, first of all, it's a good read. Second, the reason I want to support it is we have moved. The problem of the progressive left in making topics off limits because someone, not me, but someone I know might be offended um, is fundamentally stupid. We have legal frameworks around where your behaviour can start and stop, and we've decided as a society what those are. Mm. Um, and and, and if, if they're not fit for purpose, then we'll relitigate those in the courts and by governments, but not by someone's random on the left's opinion. And then the other one is just this um, managerial overreach, which is, are you are going to interfere with the brand of the university? Um, again, we <laughs> it's a really odd employment situation where you can criticise your employer by law and um, criticise society and its um, approaches in terms of policy um, and that by law, this is the Education Act and you know mm. the academic freedom. And so you, you want to take that seriously. And it also, um, it works both ways. So there'll be a lot of opinions that I completely disagree with, but people should be free to say them. And so, you know, I wanted to support that. And I suppose, lastly, I look at my own journey, the thing that's brought out the very best in me as a scientist, as a public health advocate, and, you know, in the work we've done in nutrition, you know, was fully having to front open debate where egos were bruised and it was on. Mm. Uh, these guys are coming at you and you came back and I, I, I appreciate that stuff. Yeah, it, it's, and it's, if, if you don't like doing that, then you shouldn't, you know, just like if you don't like running long distances, you shouldn't don't. be a marathon runner, then you <laughs> shouldn't be an academic. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's interesting because, you know, universities have debating competitions where there's a for and against a, a particular statement yep. or, or hypothesis, and they go hammer and tongs in, in as a sport, at, yep. you know, almost about it. And but yet when it comes to actually you know, serious stuff like research, there's almost like an approved, but you don't know what those approvals are until you say something that's contrary, and then you find out what those approvals are. <laughs> uh, that you can have a debate. And, you know, it's interesting in your forward, you talk about this, I guess, the academic acceptance that is mostly from my research, it seems to be a post-World War II emergence of this idea that a low-fat, high-carb diet uh, is the way to lose weight. But the evidence before us in society is that we've got people that are doing this and yet they're you know, um, fat bastards, really. Well, it's, it's a cl classic case of... be a fat bastard, right? And so I went through this journey too, finding out 
what works for me. And what works for me was a medium fat diet and high protein and almost no carbs. And mm. I actually didn't have to do any exercise and the weight just came off me anyway. And I was sitting there thinking, this is wrong. And when you speak up about it, then you get your Professor Boyd Swinburns and people like that who go, well, I'm a professor of nutrition and I know what I'm talking about and you need to shut up. Well, telling me to shut up never works. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it's such a fascinating mm. topic, Cam, that virtually the people put in charge of protecting your health and you know one of the main determinants in public health is what you eat. Not only didn't quite get it right, they got it. You know, there's only three macronutrients to choose from, carbs, fat, and protein. And they said you've got to minimize the fat and, you know, eat as many carbs as you want at every meal, you know, seven, five to seven servings of healthy whole grains, whatever the hell they are. So not only it was not right, it was exactly wrong. And it's the very thing that causes heart disease, stroke, dementia, all of the diabetes, all of the chronic diseases. And sure enough, if you do exactly what you said, you know, big fan of higher protein, get the carbs out and you'll be right. Well, why don't you train your body to get away from raiding the carbs uh, to get instant energy? And most, most, the, the most um, prolific carbohydrate that people have put into their body is actually sugar. Why don't you train your body to live without sugar? Then it uses fat, which is how the body stores fat. Make this, it actually makes, I'm not a scientist, but it makes logical sense to me. If you eat a high-carb diet, you end up fat. Because that's the body going, woohoo, look at all this extra energy that I've got. I'll store that. Thank you very much. And it also gets easy to access carbohydrate, but you're not allowed to say this sort of stuff. Oh, no, that's contrary. Uh, um, but but, but you, sh you should. And so, you know, that's, that's the important thing. Uh, we should take a step back, though, Cam, because mm. there's some fundamental changes here, right? So, yeah. you know, so first of all, it's always been hard to change scientists' minds because, you know, and this was the thing that, the famous psychologist Leon Festinger in the 50s came up with the idea of cognitive dissonance. Um, you know, once you've made up your mind, it's pretty hard to shift it. Um, and he, his famous book is, um, and you'll love the title, Mistakes Were Made, But Not By Us. And it's a classic, you know, you can reflect on COVID, the food pyramid, um, whatever. So, so that's always been an issue in science. And that's why this free and open debate is so important because, uh, you know, academics Believe it or not, and I know most people, most people won't believe this, but believe it or not, academics historically have actually had a, had a role in society that was useful. You know, we did invent science. A lot of the things around modern medicine we did well. You know, there's some some absolutely fabulous procedures and things that have been developed over the years, all, all through academic science. It's just that in the last 10 years, and specifically, I think um, Jonathan Haidt wrote a great book in 2018, which was pretty pathetic, but it's come through in the world called The Coddling of the American Mind. Yeah, it's a brilliant book, isn't it? Brilliant book. And then that was just accelerated by the totalitarianism of COVID. And so whatever hate was seeing in 2018 just went rampant around the world, around a, a, a sort of that progressive left. You know, can't say anything unless I'm because I could be offended. There's no room for um, hurting people's feelings here. And uh, then the sort of growth of the managerial layer in, in the mm. universities and, and the need for brand and, uh, you know, all that type of thing, you know, has, has just become such an entrenched part of the way that we think in academia that, you know, we've now made ourselves in many cases redundant and we don't actually have a role in society. Um, and so, you know, when people like um, you sometimes call people troffers, you did right because that's actually a thing. And we've lost our way and we need to refine our way. And that's why, you know, James's works has some importance here. Yeah, I mean, COVID was a big wake up call. It was certainly a big wake up call for me. You know, I've always been a free speech advocate, uh, but I was sort of gave it, I was like, okay, we have free speech and took it for granted until it was taken away. And we saw it being taken away quite vociferously and quite viciously in many instances under COVID. We saw, you know, people like Asim Moultra, you saw you know, Robert Malone uh, deliberately defamed, uh, written out of the history of mRNA. He's him saying, this is not what you use this for. You know, I, I invented this. I was involved in this. I've got I'm on the patents for this. Listen to me. This is not what you use it for. And, and they... They wrote him out of history, basically. 
And then you saw, of course, the famous case, uh, the head of public health in Sweden saying, ah, no, we're not going to do this. Um, and, and everyone turned on them, you know, the media especially. And all of a sudden you realised, you know, if you actually don't fight, I mean, literally fight for your freedoms, and freedom of speech is a right, and we have a Bill of Rights Act that says that we've got that. Well, the government just overrode all of that. And then we saw this developing throughout the university as well, where you had all of these academics that were put up in the media to discuss things. And if you did speak against them, well, you were an awful person. And so whilst they had academic freedom, there was also a constraint on the public saying we can't criticise these academics even though they're sitting there with their academic freedom. And so I've yes. always viewed academic freedom as the canary in the coal mine of free speech. Hmm. And if if academics aren't free to speak about something or have a contrary opinion, well, then we're living in a society that has controls and censorship, and I'm not, not sure we want that. Yeah, and uh, and to be fair... Simon Thornley and his group, and I was initially part of that Plan B group, uh, and then sort of got pushed a bit out of it. I think mainly from, not from those guys, but you know, it just became untenable work-wise. That there were some people making some effort, but then they ended up really on the bad end of the stick. So it's you know, one of the more shameful parts of our history, frankly. Um, mm. uh, and you, you did write about the Bill of Rights, but there's also you know one. One thing that I don't think people know is that there's the Health Act, which deals directly with the powers that the Director General has, which are extensive. But mm. they are, the important thing about them is that they're politically free. And so Bloomfield did make decisions, um, which were, and the most important one was recommending that we don't do mandates. Uh, and then they went to Cabinet and they overrode it. So that Labor Cabinet broke the law knowingly mm. there. With the powers of the Director General of Health, and you know, when 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 governments start to deliberately and deceitfully break the law, you've got, actually got a bit of a problem in society. And you know, I don't know if that was evil or just incompetence or a combination of both. I don't know what's going on there. Yeah, I mean, it, but there was a chilling effect, and you're right. In the last ten years, it's it's got really insane, and 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 there's. You know, separate arguments that are off to the side, but are also included in the academic freedom argument. So, if you decided that, based on your e experience, that there were two genders, yep. male and female, well, you'd be rounded on for daring to say otherwise, because there's this acknowledgement that tacit acknowledgement or overt acknowledgement. No, no, that we can make up whatever genders we want, and and, and every man in the street says, "Well, that's bullshit." But if you say it as an academic, then you get turned on, it, kind of like what J.K. Rowling has had, you know, and anybody else who's into that debate. But, Cam, I think it's even more nuanced than that, and, and this is an important thing, right? So mm. even within that, you're going, okay, so now we're getting, we're giving, you know, basically kids um, below voting age would normally not be able to consent to anything. If you went through a university ethics committee, you know, they they wouldn't, be able to give informed consent and now able to give consent to for medical procedures where mm. where there's plausible benefits but there's also possible plausible harms some of those harms are quite serious um just to even say that it's like you know well, there's medical procedures here guys we should have our eyes wide open and be openly discussing as a society the any possible benefits and any possible harms just say you went in with that mm. non-partisan subtlety you'd, you'd you'd be rounded on Right, so which is a ridiculous thing, right? Because that's a completely scientific discussion. Exactly, and, and I mean that's the point, isn't it? A nine-year-old yeah. can't consent to having sex with an adult. Yeah, right. That's yeah. the law. You yeah. can't do that. But they decide they want to be something else. Well, we'll go and spend tens of thousands of dollars and give you a whole lot of crazy drugs uh, to to do all of that because you know it's self-awareness. You know, it's nuts, really, and to be rounded on for that in. Yeah, you know, it's kind of like the climate argument too. I mean, how often do we hear the science is settled on climate change? Yeah, well, I, I think on our nutrition discussion, yeah, you know, the moment you hear the word, most scientists think, or the science is settled, um, that's generally a fair indication that you should look into it a bit more. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I'm not a scientist, but I understand yeah. the scientific method. Yeah, right? and so. 
if the science is settled, and it's very rare that the science is settled on particularly new things, then there's something wrong. It's either absolutely settled, we all agree on this, or there's more that needs to be looked into. No, but but it's never settled. That's the whole point of science. By definition, it's 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 not settled. It's not a settled thing. And you know, a classic thing are uh, Newton's laws of physics. We all generally agree they seem to work, uh, but actually, there's an approximation for something much more complicated that's going on. So it was, and and they're actually wrong, uh, yeah. Yeah, under many conditions. So so the science is never settled. Uh, well, science used to be that we lived on a flat Earth. <laughs> Right. So if Are you we kidding? Is, is that change? Settled, we'd still be thinking, mind you, there are some people who still think we live on a flat <laughs> <laughs> That is a disc floating in space. But the important thing here is that if we've got a form of censorship or a censorious behaviour through whatever means, it could be the progressive left, it could be managerialism, a safetyism, all of those things, that's what James was saying. These, these, All of these things have all combined to create a censorious uh, nature in our academia. That then is, and I'll use the word infecting, infecting society because those people who believe those things and, and, and are censorious are teaching young people who then go on once they've got their qualifications to work in the civil service or in in general society and taking those views that have been effectively brainwashed into them with them and we end up with a debilitative society that hasn't learned to critically think or argue the point on anything. Well, you know, to take that a step further, you know, one of the things you'd argue about, about, you know, aspects of poor mental health, particularly in young people, um, is that that either you know more bad stuffs happening to them, or less bad stuffs happening to them, but they're not robust in a mm-hmm. way to deal with life as it happens in an up and down way. Uh, and I think there's a reasonable argument in that sort of 16 to 25 age group that the you know tripling of of you know mild to moderate mental health problems are probably more to do with a lack of robustness uh, in in the last decade than anything else. And you know this is why these aspects are so important. Oh, you know, don't think about that. You might find it might find it difficult. You know, they, these are oh, you know are you having negative thoughts and feelings? Oh well, you know, here's a way to not think about that. You know, or take that thing away, which is um, you know fundamentally a stupid approach um, on first principles to you know to dealing with life as it exists in the actual world. Yeah, I mean, I, I sit there and think, are we bringing up a nation of sissies? Because <laughs> if, you, if you look at the past, I mean, I'm, I'm someone who calls calls things how I say them, and I use plain language, and, and people get offended by that, but that's their problem. That's a them problem, not a me problem. Yeah. Um, but, you know, in 1944, we had 18-year-olds charging off landing craft into machine gun nests and doing incredibly brave things. In the defence of freedom and democracy. And 18-year-olds now need safe spaces. Um, They can't work out whether they're Arthur or Martha. And they need to be, you know, coddled, um, molly-coddled. And, you know, oh, no, we can't say that because Sebastian or Tarquin might get upset and get hurty feelings. Well, my mother used to say to me when somebody said something mean and I said to her, oh, someone said something mean to me at school, she said, so what? Sticks and stones will break your bones, but words will never hurt you. And I wonder why why that's all disappeared and why has it disappeared in academia when the whole uh, scientific method is based around actually arguing? Yeah, well, I mean, the other plausible reason for that, of course, is that there's a whole lot of academics that don't engage in the scientific method at all. Mm. And, and the, the most high-profile example of that recently is this uh, ray gun, the break dancer from the Aussie Olympics. And take away the fact that it's an it's an abomination. This, the sport's ridiculous, uh, and the good fun part that it was an Aussie, and we can mock them more now than ever. You know, the reality is she's a hard left feminist pedagogy academic. When you see what this what they mean when they say we do research into this, mm. you know, there's no there's no human, and this is why people round on the um, Health Research Council, uh, MB, and the Marsden Fund, and these sorts of things, because mm. you know some of these things are funded, and people just look at them and go, "What well, doesn't make any sense from first principles?" Um, you know, that said, they also fund a bunch of good science, so you know it's not a hundred percent bad. But um, yeah, that's just a classic example at the moment of you know they they don't 
they're not, they don't want to engage in science because they're not scientists. They don't do science. They don't understand the process. They have no, not only do they not understand it, they they round on it as though it's a, I don't know, what's you know, it's a Western positivist male hegemony. I don't know all the words exactly, but you know what I'm talking we about. Don't, we don't know the buzzwords because we don't use. Them. So, <laughs> but but, yeah. it, but is, doesn't that raise an interesting point though that could funding or where the funding comes from in in the and this is the, this is what's hugely ironic for me who enters into debates on the benefits of nicotine for example i mean it's yeah. it, it's actually been a, a savior to me nicotine in helping me recover from a severe stroke that i had five nearly six years ago yeah um, but but you talk about that to a medical professional or anybody else and they just think you're nuts but, but they haven't read what i've read which are peer reviewed medical studies that say nicotine is beneficial for you know, increasing neuroplasticity and those sorts of things. But you can't have those arguments because someone gets all po-faced about it and then you find out, well, actually they're being funded by XYZ company and their corporate policy is that they're against this sort of thing and now you've got the funding happening to the research in the, in the university and all of a sudden you have to be quiet because it might affect the funding. It's interesting that nicotine stuff. I'm deep down that rabbit hole at the moment, actually, Cam. Um, you know, and because I, I think you know, quite often now the science isn't getting done in the universities; it's getting done in the podcaster sphere, mm. with 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 people, lay people that are just curious and the sort of microdosing of nicotine, its effect in the brain, as you say, around neuroplasticity. There's a, a new hypothesis about a specific light sensitive uh, component, often in brain cells, called melanin. It's also in your skin that. Losing that's a problem. Nicotine helps with that. There's a whole uh, bunch of it's just cutting edge. That stuff. Great it's awesome. With all sorts of things. Yeah. But we've all been told for the last thirty years nicotine's evil. And well, well it, it is in the sense that it comes in tobacco and it's a addictive drug and 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 you put it in the smokes and you start chucking down you know a packet a day. Obviously, that's going to end badly. But that's not what we're talking about, right? No. no I mean, you know, if you use uh, nicotine pouches or um, or you know, vaping, which is far less uh, dangerous. It's dangerous still. You know, it's got yep. its harms, but they're, they're a lot less than smoking, burning things, and inhaling all of the extra chemicals that tobacco companies add to the tobacco to make it burn faster. I mean, if you light a cigarette and sit it on an ashtray, it'll burn right to the end without any inhaling or anything. Mm. If you do that with a cigar, it'll go out. Mm. Right? Because the cigar is just tobacco. There's nothing else in it. And tobacco doesn't burn that particularly well. But yeah, it, it's all to blame. Everything's blamed on nicotine, but nicotine's actually not harmful. In fact, it's in yeah. tomatoes, amongst, and many other and many other plants uh, from the nightshade family have full of nicotinoids, and there are benefits. But you're not allowed to say anything about it because then, oh, you're in the pay of big tobacco, and they slur and smear and defame you for daring to have a different opinion. And, and I didn't that, realize you were quite so well read in the in the medicine part. That's cool. Well, you know, when you're lying in hospital and you've just about died, yeah, and you've decided you want to live, someone like me, that we do, I just get straight into the right. How do I fix this? <laughs> Whereas I was getting medical professionals come up to me, you know, neurosurgeon with thirty years' experience, saying, "Well, then you better get used to being a cripple for the rest of your life, Cam." And I said, well, stuff that. I don't like that. Doesn't sound like um, a whole lot of fun. I'm going to fix this. Well, you know, in my experience, Cam, you know, you're not going to fix this. Well, I have. So why don't we look at Cam the miracle and find out what he did? And let's try and get other people to do the same thing. And maybe we won't have poor outcomes for people in their late 40s or early 50s having a stroke and spending a lifetime on welfare um, and poor outcomes. Yeah, a lot of a lot of inertia to overcome there, and uh, yeah. big pharma, you know, big food, and and you know that whole sort of medical complex. Yeah. I suppose the the most encouraging thing to happen in the last little while is this uh, RFK Junior's speech mm -hmm. in the last week or so, which has sort of said, look, if he joins him with um, Trump, he's going to take charge of the health system, and you know he's the first person that started to talk about the corruption in the FDA and. Yeah, USDA and uh, these types of uh, NIH. Corruption. I mean, yeah. if, if we take COVID as an example, and people go, oh, you're harping on a bit, but let's have a look at it. What many people don't realise is that in the initial stages of COVID, Cabinet met and they decided 
at some point that it would be a good idea when we do the lockdowns that we also don't allow people to buy alcohol and we don't allow people to buy tobacco products or or any any of those sorts of products. That's that's what our doing and some of our ministers wanted to do. With no understanding of addictions, no understanding of of anything like that, and effectively trying to cold turkey people. And that that, that was a a deliberate decision that was made at cabinet and it was opposed and successfully opposed but i can't imagine the carnage that would have caused if they if they had done that but when you look at it and you think how why was that and you look a bit deeper and then you realize that you look at all the things that they all of a sudden were banned around the world you had uh, hydroxychloroquine defamed you know fish tank cleaner um you know bleach uh, all of these things and then they said ivermectin was a horse dewormer and all this sort of thing well People I know that regularly smoke cigars or regularly partake in nicotine products, whether they're oral nicotine products or vapes, none of them got COVID, including me. And then you start wondering, was there some sort of order or instruction that said stop people taking these products because it will stop them getting COVID, which means they'll have to have the vaccine, which was supposed to stop them getting COVID. <laughs> right? It's interesting with that because I – you know, I've generally I've sort of shifted a bit on that because, you know, originally I'd be going, you know, you look at large organisations just from a university point of view, you know, <laughs> and uh, the university's out to get me. I was like, no, they're not. We're actually functionally useless. We're not capable of doing that. And yeah. so, you know, I'm generally against those sort of theories on the fact that, you know, most organisations and um, companies and then governments are generally so dis- so useless that they can't even do anything yet. But yeah, you're right. There was more going on. It seemed to be more going on there. So you know, maybe have to revise my initial position there. I mean, you've mentioned in the forward too that we've got a legal framework here, and and all of these little anecdotes le- are leading to this, right? Where we have a Human Rights Act, we've got a Bill of Rights Act, and we've got an Education Act. It was it's called the Education and Training Act, which all protect supposedly set out our rights and our freedoms and safeguarding for everybody what is the rule of law around things, right? We have a right to not only speak, but a right to uh, receive information as well. And you're, in the last 10 years, and particularly in the last uh, in the last six years, what we've seen is an abrogation of all of those laws by politicians who said, well, no, we, d- we don't think we should have to follow the law. We're going to override it or we're going to just bypass it. And there's been court cases that shows that some of the decisions made during COVID, et cetera, that academics were pushing publicly to do these things were actually illegal. And if you've got a government, as you've said, that's willing to break the law for what they determine is a, a bit a bigger good right, or, a, or a better reason that it's okay to do that, then why have the laws in the first place? And again, yeah. we come back to this academic freedom where the Education and Training Act specifically says that you are the critic and conscience of society and therefore your freedoms need to be protected more than anybody else in a job, essentially, <laughs> right? And, and that's why at the moment, you know, the law part is so important. So when people put up and say, hey, we, we want a discussion around the law, like the stuff around the Treaty of Waitangi is interesting in that regard. Mm. It's like, it's not a threat to, to anything. It's just like, we're a social democracy. We will have a robust discussion around this and we'll get to where we get to and everyone's entitled to their opinion. There's nothing evil about that. That's ex- that, There's something good, fundamentally good about that. Um, mm-hmm. But as a country, we've failed to you know, have the balls, basically, to, to engage in that, which you know, I think is a shame because it's obviously contentious and people have different views. Um, but gosh, that's the whole point of a social democracy. Well, we've reached a point now where people are held up in the media as being brave for speaking out, when speaking out should be the default, right? You should be able to do that at any time, but now they're held up as being brave Mm. speaking out, which means everybody else are a bunch of cowards, right? I mean, that's a logical conclusion. Yeah, Uh, that's true. I mean, I've always spoken freely. It's what's got me in trouble a few times, but you've got to take your lumps, and fight your corner. And I've always been taught to front my fight my corner. I mean, that's the one great thing my mother taught me. You know, it's all right, Cam, to have opinions, but you better be able to back them up. 
So, like, how do you feel about that? Because you you probably see you know people on the other side coming at you, and you're okay with that, are you? Well, they can come at me. I don't. Know. People are entitled to their opinions. I always say they're like noses. Everyone's got one, mm. right? But when we don't all live in a society, where, I'm left-handed. You can't make me right-handed. Right? You can't say no. That's it. We're going to regulate and say no left-handed people because that's basically what what they're trying to do with free speech, they're trying to say, well, we don't like your opinion, so you have to be quiet. Well, I just, when someone says it to me, I just say, get stuffed. You know, I get people on on Twitter or X, they come in and say, oh, you're irrelevant. And, and I reply to them every time, and yet here you are. Yeah. Are you with an irrelevant person? What does that make you? Yeah. But, you, you know, that's just the point. You could be irrelevant, but oh, big deal. Well, that's your opinion. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I could be irrelevant. That's your opinion. Yeah, You're yeah. To that. And you yeah. know what? I'll defend you having the opinion, even though it's wrong, right? Yeah. You can have that opinion and I'll defend it. But will you defend my right to be right? Yeah. Well, well the answer is no, they won't because they're censorious. Yeah. And, you know, I think this report and, and you speaking out in the report are very important that we actually learn these things. But the one, what scares me. And it does scare me because if you lose the right to freedom of speech and if academics lose the right to their academic freedom to speak freely, then we're starting the slippery slope towards totalitarianism and we've seen how quick we can get there. And if you start saying we need these restrictions because someone might get hurty feelings, we've got a problem and it's a big problem. And what comes from that next, we don't need to know what comes next because we've seen what comes next. We've seen it in communist societies. We've seen it under fascism in various guises, you know, Chile, Nazi Germany, Italy, Spain, et cetera. We don't, we don't need to guess what comes next. We know what comes next. And none of that's good. I, I 100% agree with that because right? you would always look, especially as a as a younger man, you'd look at societies of past, and you just quoted several of them there, and you just go, how could that happen? I just can't imagine how that would happen. Well, after COVID, happens, now, we, now we know. In small steps is how it happened. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, I, I visited Israel in 2014, and I went to Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum there, because I'd always wondered how on earth did this happen? How did... Jewish German citizens let this happen to them. And the um, museum tells you how it happened because the entire museum is the journey of a Jewish person through. So you walk through these different hallways and, and every time you cross a bridge, that's a piece of legislation that was enacted and then you end up in the world that happens after that. And you go and look at the display of that and then you cross the bridge back onto the other side of the museum and that was a piece of legislation. And that steps you through and you realise how it, it didn't start with the death camps. Mm. It started by saying you need to wear a gold star. And then it took a little step further and 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 now you're having a shower. And that's what happens when you let, that's the, that's the slippery slope that everyone scoffs at, but it's real. You let those things happen. If you don't stand up and say, no, we're not going to tolerate that, then, and if you let that happen, then you, you'll let the next step happen as well. Yeah. So, because it's interesting with that, because I'd been thinking about that a lot as well and thinking, well, you know, because of modern social media, surely there's just a, a big enough group of people that will just go, no, nah, screw this, it will never happen. But that didn't <laughs> seem to be the case. It actually seemed to push it even further the other way. Because I, I keep thinking that the, Modern information age means this could never happen again, but I'm actually not convinced about that. No, we, we saw it could happen again. Yeah. And people don't like me saying that, oh, you can't compare COVID with the Holocaust. Well, we can because the Holocaust didn't happen just immediately. It took place over a number of years. And we saw that slide. Well, okay, you need to stay at home. Well, hang on. The Health Act says that only if I'm sick do I need to stay No, we're telling you you all need to stay at home. That was the first break of the law. And they turned the Health Act upside down and inside out and made it say things and do things that it wasn't intended to do. And and the majority of New Zealanders went, okay, I'm all right with that. And yeah, it wasn't, you, you, you it wasn't see. the people went down to Parliament and said, we're not okay with this, that it all started to unravel. I think the thing that most sticks in my mind, Cam, and it's the place that we both exercise, I was down to Tekapuna Beach one day and 
Um, the police were then taking an ma uh, elderly man out of the water, manhandling him, hands behind his back, uh, because he was swimming. How dare he? The danger of it all. But, oh. you know, honestly, that we could get to that is just it's an astonishing thing, really. Totally. But, but, you know, it's important. People like you stand up. Um, yeah, James does this research. I'm hoping that the, the universities take that on board. Um, it's kind of ironic, too, because um, you said AUT was the worst. Um, AUT is also the university that um, releases the report into the slide in public confidence in the media. You know, to put, these two, <laughs> put these two reports together and here's your problem, right? Yeah. Now solve it. Yeah. You know, on one slightly good side, nothing to do with AUT, but um, Otago, who I've been roundly critical of and the, for the last several years, um, at least issued a statement recently around economic freedom and expression and, and welcoming that. That has to turn into practice, but there's something. Mm. I mean, I've had a run-in with several um, Otago academics over the years. Um, some of them even tried to sue me because I called them hurty things. But, um, you know, I'm still here and still carrying on because um, we need to live free and we need to speak freely and we need to have people like you as academics who speak out um, because if we don't protect those freedoms, if we don't protect your freedoms um, in academia, then we're actually not protecting our own freedoms in the end. Yeah, and that is an important thing. Like I... You know, I don't want to sort of be in defence of the university because we haven't really behaved ourselves for de for a decade, but we could actually still play a good role in society as as, as a thing. Totally. I mean, yeah, that that's a given, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think it, the things this report raises are critical, and we can't just sweep it under the carpet. And that's why, you know, I've had your on you on the show. That's why I've uh, spoken to James as well, because if we don't talk about these things and raise the awareness amongst the general public, then these reports just slide away as just another academic treatise that we can safely ignore. <laughs> True. All right, Grant, well, thank you so much for your time and uh, sharing why you wrote that forward. I'd really recommend to everybody that they go to the New Zealand Initiative website and download that report, and uh, and I'll make sure that we've got a link to it as well um, on the you know, the, on our website, on RCR's website um, for these interviews. But uh, I really appreciate your time and talking about academic freedom and the importance. And, um, you know, maybe you and I will catch up on Takabuna Beach one morning. Look forward to it. Thanks a lot. Cheers, mate. Bye. Isn't it interesting to see the correlation between academic freedom and all our other freedoms? Academic freedom enables scientists to propose new ideas, test hypotheses, and advance knowledge, even at the risk of being wrong. If that is lost, then it is our freedoms next. Tell me what you think. Email inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Thank you for tuning in to RCR Reality Check Radio. If you like what you're listening to, just like what you're listening to. Either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057. That's 2057. Or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We would love to hear from you. So connect with us today.